take nine. Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, oh, Lord. Mm. Daylight, wake me. We will ride. Go. Sunlight wake me, we will ride, going to the other side. Daylight wake me, we will ride, going to the other side. Sunlight wake me, we will ride, going to the golden road on the other side. I was born into slavery from my mother feeling disrespected. She passed it down through generations. You gotta work harder. And I tried to be much better. Black sheep, she was. Take nine. Ooh, 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 oh, oh, Lord. Mm-hmm. Daylight, wake me. We will ride. Go.
<laughs> Take nine. <laughs> Take nine.
<laughs> Take nine. Ooh, 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 ooh. Uh, <laughs> Take nine. Ooh, 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 ooh. Uh, I'm
you know, we can have our, I mean,
we got we got some uh <laughs> creature or are we we're not no we're not broadcasting in there yet um that's me standing that's the other me the other you standing okay. over by the the red dot gotcha um i just need to get my cues here so this one Oops, let me shut that notification off Take nine. All right. I love you. Welcome, I love you. Uh, welcome back to the, the Rope It Up Lounge in the Metaverse. Uh, my name is Lewis, and we have a great show queued up for you tonight. 
what are we doing here? Why are we experimenting with the metaverse, even when the biggest companies on the planet have decided to abandon it? Because we can connect people. And these are stories that have to be told. This is music that has to be heard. And we have the ability to talk directly with avatars, with people from around the world in this room. And six months from now, I'm going to see this with dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of people hanging around and ha having the ability to actually communi communicate with each other without scrolling and swiping and liking and things like that. So with that said, we have a great cast here tonight. I'm going to turn it over to my co-host partner in crime, Mr. Fabian Brown. Fabian, how are you? Doing great, Lewis. Uh, thanks for the time here, and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, for all of you people in the virtual world, you know, I get I get the the, the tough part, the nervous part, where I get to introduce our our special guests. Um, and I and I, and I say it's tough just because you know Lewis and Ropadope have a have a great way of uh, just introducing me to some pretty significant people. And today, uh, it's it doesn't fall short of that. We are here with uh, Miss Cole Williams. Brooklyn born, not New Orleans, as I learned today. Brooklyn born. Uh, she's a recording artist. She's a songwriter, a producer. She's a multi multi instrumentalist. She's a a host for WWOZ, and she's a humanitarian based out of New Orleans. She's all these wonderful things. But it's clear in the short time that I've gotten to learn about Cole and my exchange with her that her passions are are really just uplifting the human spirit. And that's really, really obvious. And we're going to get into that today. You know, with all of her gifts and talents uh, and her resources, uh, she's here to help build uh, a freedom movement and to make it stronger by representing music and a lifestyle that is humane and equitable. And I pull that right from your website. And I, we have to dig into uh, all, all of this stuff today. We might not get to everything today, Cole, but we're going to dig into some stuff today. And I think, you know, just for some for some context, um, cause I know you're, you're currently based in New Orleans, but you're from Brooklyn and I know you've traveled the world. Maybe you can share how New Orleans is similar and maybe even different to some other cities that you've been in. Um, I love to just give the people out there a good sense of what's going on. All right. Well, you, you just did your thing with that introduction. <laughs> I'm going to sample it. Well, um, Thank you for joining us. You know, this is really a great time, I think, in our history where a lot of good changes can happen. Um, about eight years ago, I moved from Brooklyn, New York to New Orleans. Um, I visited this place on tour. I thought that the culture was just oozing out of the streets. Um, it felt like a place that was colorful and lively enough that I could make my home base. And I haven't looked back ever since. I don't really know what brought me here, I say God. But um, the things that I've learned and I keep on learning about myself, about the city of New Orleans, about the country, about the world, this city is so special. This is the foundation of the U.S. You can trace all art, music, just anything social and political. You can trace it back to this small area that's, I think, sometimes discarded. You know, people don't really know, like, what a full gumbo of, of magic is happening down here. So as a Brooklyn girl living in New Orleans, I've just learned how to be much more friendly and to take that mean mug off. You know, New York, you can't you can't smile. They take, take it as a sign of weakness, but in New Orleans, everybody's gonna say hello. How you doing? You don't walk by somebody and they'll say, how you doing? It's very strong culturally. People look out for each other. You will never go hungry in the city. You should never go hungry because somebody is gonna feed you. So we are all family. When I first moved here, they said everything is 15 minutes away, and it's true. If it takes more than 50 minutes, it's because of traffic. Um, there's so many different organizations, though, doing a lot of positive work. Um, I think New Orleans has the highest amount of nonprofits per capita in the U.S. So there are a lot of people in New Orleans itself that are really intentional about uplifting their community. They want to see everybody thrive. And... That's kind of the space that I started. I wanted to have a home that was a will be an example to other people that are that are looking at me as an example. And this place holds me accountable. This place loves me. I love it back. Um, and the music. I mean, we can't even talk about that. 
<laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna we're gonna jump into the music. We're gonna jump into the culture. Uh, we're gonna jump into more of the family or orientation of what you're experiencing. And I love speaking of family. I'd love for you to introduce our our other guests here and and how you're connected with everybody. I would love to. So I want to introduce first Papa Mali. Papa Mali is a New Orleanian. So this man is the spirit of New Orleans, definitely. Um, incredible singer, songwriter, guitar player, record producer, and human being. And um, he and I, we play some shows together where it just feels like this healing experience. So I'm so happy that he can join us today as a fellow lover of human beings and lover of humanity. And then we have Mr. Carlton Jamal Smith, who I more recently met. Um, he and I are working on a couple of songs with a producer based out in Sweden. And um, Carlton is just a dynamic personality, which you guys will get to see. And he's also just an incredible soul, soul artist that I, I really connect with on this deep level of, of musicality. So welcome, Carlton. Welcome, Papa. Thank you. <laughs> Glad to be here. <laughs> and it's it's been really great. It's really been great working with you lately, Cole. I, I have uh, I've definitely been a fan of yours for a long time. And it's so good it's so, so good to now call call myself your friend and to be doing uh doing some music with you and now to be uh sharing this with you as well. Absolutely. And you know, I just also want to say I respect both of these artists and people so much so it's it's so great to have you here supporting me and uh growing together <laughs> and, and let, let me say this and also that that's a wonderful thing it is so refreshing in this business because we come across a lot of artists or people who consider themselves artists but you don't always respect them you may not say it you know because it may not be appropriate but you know deep down inside you don't always respect them or you just figure how did you make it or or why are you taking it you know what i'm saying but when you come across somebody you connect with and, and you feel good about them. It just, it just music is already doing that for us anyway. But this the, is true. Like to another person, like I said, Papa Mall and everybody else, I'm gonna get to know you. Cole and I have connected. And like I said, Cole, I, I love your voice. I listen to it. I listen to some of the stuff and it affects me emotionally. And I'm like, I need that. Cause sometimes you think you, you, you get so jaded in this business, you know? So that respect thing is refreshing because yeah, everybody thinks they're an artist nowadays, you know? I'm not. Carlton, don't go back. <laughs> Don't get me started. Uh, I'm really trying to behave. <laughs> so let me jump Everybody in here. Everybody takes their artists. Let me jump in, and and uh, we I, I want to address the, the the issue of the day. Um, the music will come throughout, um, but uh, Cole, um, and you can talk more about this in your own words. Has been been working with activists and 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 musicians and helpers in New Orleans. Uh, to house the houseless. Uh, I, my two cents as I was thinking about this on the way in is how great is a country if some people don't have a house? That's always been my line. And so let's, let me uh, cue up the first video here uh, so people can get a sense of what you're doing and then we can talk about it. Does that work? Sounds good to me. Oh yeah. <laughs> In New Orleans, activists are demanding city officials expand a program to provide hotel rooms for unhoused people during the pandemic. This is community organizer Cole Williams. The Black Panthers coined the phrase, power to the people, during the freedom movement. Today, right now, in this moment, we are all called to uplift those people that you don't make eye contact with and pass on the street, the least of ours. We gotta dig deep, and we gotta dig deeper. We gotta scream, we gotta shout, we gotta bang on doors, and we gotta let them know to empower the people. We must give power to the people. Uh, when it comes down to G N O C R T, um, tell me something good. 
Well, um, I'll try not to take up too much time, but I just want to say how we got started. Please. Uh, in 2020, early March, um, actually earlier in 2020, I met a civil rights veteran, Mr. Curtis Muhammad. Um, I was singing at a Martin Luther King Day tribute, and we met. And from that day on, this man took me under his wing. He um, is a founding member of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He was trained directly by Ella Baker. And he said to me, I have all of this knowledge, I have all of this wisdom about organizing, and I just want to share it with somebody. And I've always loved helping people, but I hadn't quite found my way of doing it besides singing some good songs. And we spoke and and he asked me, you know, what what is a what is a, a passion? What is what is a, a cause that really means something to you? And I said, Well, people living on the streets. I said, I don't really understand it. And um he told me to start talking to them, like figure out what I want to do, like how would I want to help them? And I said, well, I'm a musician. Why don't we throw concerts under the bridge? There's a bridge called the North Claiborne Bridge. And it's it used to be a big encampment for the in-house. So I went over there, spoke to a few people that were living on the street, found out that one of them was the main point person and asked him, do you want me to have a concert here? Would that be all right? He said, sure. I said, is it all right if we bring some food? He said, sure. I said, is there anything else that you'd like us to bring that you guys need? He said, maybe some books, some toiletry kits. You know, because when Curtis taught me, he taught me that you don't go to people in need and tell them what they need. When you go to people in need, you ask them, how, how can we help you? What do you need to get out of the situation? So I went to the in-house in a very much a servant mentality. Like, how can I serve you? I'm not looking for any credit. I just want to see how I can help, and I don't think I have all the answers. Well, we did this concert. Um, it was me, a percussionist, the horn player, and had the toiletry kits, and it was just a, a good time. I was speaking with people that I would have never talked to before. And then the next week, I thought we were going to do it again, and COVID hit. So I thought, wow, the spirit didn't bring me to these people for me to just throw them to the side. What do they really need now? They've always needed housing. So let's get together and let's see how we can support them. So we started demonstrating with them in front of New Orleans City Hall every day at 6 a.m. We were out there demonstrating. They finally got uh, access to the hotels to shelter in place and kind of get them into the system to sign up for housing. But that process is so long. You have to wait for about a year in New Orleans to say that you've been homeless for a year. And if they think you have a couch to sleep on, they won't put you ahead on the list. So we took some of the unhoused people we were working with. We drove to different neighborhoods that are blighted. And we went house, sh house shopping. We said, we're going to use citizens' rights to reclaim city-owned blighted property renovate them with the people that are going to live in them while teaching them marketable skills. And from June 2020 to December of last year, we've been meeting every week, renovating with donations, construction donations, um, volunteer labor donations, some monetary donations. What's happened now is that the city has shut us down. Um, the city has uh, deemed an organization in charge of auctioning off blighted properties, and they targeted us specifically. And they took the stairs down, they boarded it up. Because we are partnered with Trader Joe's and uh, Culture Aid NOLA, and we still do, uh, distribute groceries to the unhoused and that community. So uh, about 80 bags of groceries go out every Saturday. And our demonstration is working with the people. So. The people that are packing the groceries are unhoused people, our neighborhood people, our volunteers with means, our musicians, Charmaine Neville was with us about two weeks ago. There are people that are in the community that want to get involved, but don't know how. They think it's so overwhelming because there's no support around it. And we're saying, get involved, think about the solution and do what you can, but build a collective around that and have collective agreements. But I wouldn't be here in this space thinking in this wonderful, humane way, always just learning to grow if it weren't for my mentor, Curtis Muhammad, that passed away in uh, January of last year. So I was trained in that elevator style of organizing, and that's how we founded the Greater New Orleans Citizens Relief Team. Why did the city go after you? Is it, were they embarrassed? 
Well, I think that's a good question, but I think it's also the broader question of why are there people living on the street? Why are they disposable? Like, why don't we really care as a global society, not just in New Orleans? Yeah, so yeah. one thing is we're active, we're solution oriented, we're looking for we're looking to get people off the streets by any means necessary, mental health care, um, living in apartments to go to houses, living in homes. But we're offering many solutions where the city and many cities are stuck. They're stuck in their way of doing things. They don't want to expand. And their goal is not on the people. Their goal is on their job. We're focused on the people. I'm saying that people shouldn't be living on the street and get them off yeah. by yeah. any means. You think they'd be glad you, you know, you're doing something that they didn't have to do. I'm, I'm, just, I'm shocked at that. Wow. Mankind and his need for money. Wow. What is, well, Papa, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you jump in and you know, you know, what, what are you hearing? What is, what is your experience and take on this? Well, from my experience, um, I did, um, as I, as I told Cole, uh, there was a time from about, uh, starting about a little over 20 years ago until about, um, fifth, I don't know, maybe for about seven years or so, uh, I helped organize this thing where musicians would get together every Sunday and play music and, and um, not charge a admission, but, t but pass around a collection bucket or whatever. And uh, all of the proceeds would go to help local homeless organizations. And as a result, I got to meet a lot of people that are working with people on the street. Now, this was in Austin, Texas. This was um, post Katrina where a lot of people had evacuated to Austin. And uh, I knew lots of musicians and people there. And we, so we started this thing, long story short, it became very popular. We, we got where we were over the course of about seven or eight years, we raised almost a quarter of a million dollars to give to local homeless organizations. One of the things that I learned, this is where I was going with this, is that, um, you know, there's, there's really, um, different levels of homelessness. There are people who are young and able-bodied and more or less choose to be homeless because of various things, whether they're just uh, living a transient lifestyle, they're addicted to drugs or whatever, that, those things. And then there's a, also another large group of people who really, you know, are through no fault of their own, have found themselves in a situation where they can't they, they don't have a home. They've lost their home. They've lost their job. They've lost their family. They're uh, in an abusive relationship, whatever. You know, there's so many reasons why people are living on the street. And all of them are valid in their own way. Um, although, you know, there's there should be, I realize how frustrating it is for people that work with the homeless to have the same sort of compassion towards those young, able-bodied people who choose to live that way when there are people that are really in need today of all the, the basic things in life, you know, food, shelter, clothing, um, and compassion, and somebody that cares. Uh, that's something another thing Cole and I were talking about how um, the homeless population seems, you know, when it, when it gets to a certain point, it's almost as if those people become invisible and they feel invisible. They feel like people walk right past them, drive right past them and don't even look at them and don't even see them as being human somehow. And somehow we have to bridge that gap and make people that are fortunate enough to have homes to realize that, you know, there, but for the grace of God, go I. It's good. It could happen right. to any of us at any time through no fault of our own. And we need to bridge that gap where where people just drive by these tent cities and it's almost like they just choose not to see it. Um, it's, it, it needs to, we need to, we need to find a way to, to an awareness that uh, makes everyone seem more human um, so that, because they are everybody that's, everybody that's out there, whether they're able-bodied or not, they are human beings and they do have a story. And there's some reason that, they landed in this position. And uh, I think that's one of the first steps is just opening up our minds, opening up our ears and our hearts and listening to the stories. 
I think that's would you well say said. that's a fair call? I, I agree with you completely. I, I think the humanizing part is a major part. It's I don't know any other species that doesn't take, take care of their own. You know, when I look at uh, unhoused people, I'm looking at them as part of my ecosystem. So when they're raised up, automatically everything on top of that gets raised up and lifted up too. So I think there's this disconnect where people think that if we help unhoused people that we're taking away from people with means. But what happens is that everybody gets better. <laughs> you lift it up. You know, you lift from the bottom, everything that's on top of the bottom gets lifted up automatically. So I just think it's a simple situation if we put people first and uh, self-interest second. Um, I think that's a great pausing point now to get into into another video and jumping right back in on this topic, putting putting people first. Uh, you know, what is what is uh, inclusion look like? What does equity look like? You know, for for all human beings. Um, Lewis, I have a, a cue here for give power to the people for the music video. Is that correct? I certainly hope so. <laughs> it's no reason because we have a PhD, a master's, a BA, a BS from a university that we have more genius than anybody else. We have to approach each human being with the dignity and the expectation that we can discover genius we never even dreamed of. Particularly when you're talking about the pain and suffering and depression. How can we possibly know from a classroom academic setting can we discover how to eliminate poverty, how to stop the suffering that people have as a result of white supremacy and racism? Somebody got to ask the people who suffer. I mean, the doctor even do that. What do you hurt? You know, every time I watch that video, that's that's Curtis Muhammad, that's my mentor. But his words are always just so profound. And, you know, that's something that sticks with me. A doctor even asks you, before a doctor treats you, they got to find out where do you hurt. So we as a society, we as people, we have to stop trying to solve these problems with what we think is going on. If you've never been unhoused, you have no idea what it's like to be unhoused or to be without. So let's like work together is, is really what I take from that. I noticed you say uh, unhoused of the houses. Is, is homeless become a term that's no longer used now? Well, you know, while we were speaking with the unhoused during the pandemic, um, the more that I got to know them, the more that me saying, calling them homeless just seemed, that it felt disrespectful. So because I knew them, I felt like homeless. I, I didn't like the term. And when you think of somebody like the, your home, that's you. My home is here, so I'm going to bring my home anywhere. So to say that someone doesn't have a home, that's not actually talking about the problem. What they lack is the house. So we asked them, what you know, what do they prefer to be referred to? And one actually said this place. So the reason I don't say this place is because I just feel there's so much of a gap between homeless to this place. And I'm just trying to ease us into the way that we regard, we regard okay. people. Okay. So ask them, well, that's good question. to know. I didn't realize that either. Yeah. You know, Cole, your mentor had said on, on the video that we just watched, somebody's got to ask the people who are suffering, you know, le learning about, um, you know, poverty or being unhoused from an academic point of view is probably not the way to go about it. Somebody's got to ask the people who are suffering, you know, tell me a little bit more what that, what that means to you. Oh, I love it. I love when he's, you know, this man is a, is intelligent. He has a college degree, you know, so we're not saying throw out your college degrees um, and uh, get with the people. What we're saying is that your college degree is not a replacement for the practice. You can get any all kinds of theory, you know, from sitting in a classroom, but you're not going to get to the root of the problem unless you get to deal with the people. And in, in our experience as a grassroots organization, We've attempted to work with other nonprofit organizations, and I would say 95% of them did not want to work with us because the way that we work challenges their entire establishment. They don't go to the people. They sit in a room and they discuss what the crisis is. So we have people living on the street. 
what do you think we should do? Well, they need to they need to get into shelters or they need to have have apartments. They think apartments are long term mm -hmm. housing. There's not one person in need that's sitting at that table that can say this is why that's not going to work. <laughs> So let's get out of the theory. You know, the theory is not doing anything but building ambiguity, I believe. Let's get to the people and let's talk to them. And we're not saying that everybody wants a house. There's some unhoused people that we've spoken to that think that they're comfortable where they are, but they're in survival mode. There's not one person alive that wants to sleep on the street. So we target, you know, our outreach to people that are interested in housing. And that's the people that we're interested in speaking with. And then when other people come around and it's about building trust, when they start to believe us more because they've seen us every Saturday out there saying the same thing, they might start to open up. But there's a lot of distrust in the unhoused community, rightfully so. And so part of working with them is being patient, um, not putting our needs in front of their needs and trying to help them see how we can work together to make them have a better life. And they should be able to do it on their own. It seems like you guys, um, it's almost like you're getting so many results. Like these other people are embarrassed. That's what I keep getting. Like they don't want to mess with you because you guys are getting results and finding solutions and they're not. That's that's what I seem to, uh, I don't know. That's what I get. Like, hey, you're making them, you, you showing them all up. Hey, please keep on doing it. You know, that's not even a thought. Like I wake up on Saturday morning. Sometimes I'm so tired. But I tell you, once I step out and lift up a box, a groceries that I know I'm gonna start bagging up. I just start to feel good and I'm energized for the rest of the day. There's nothing. Mm -hmm. See, that's what they're not doing. See, that, that's, you making a, you like the boxer that's getting up and training, they're not training. So, man, much love and respect <laughs> for you, are you doing it? But these are these silent acts of kindness that I think everybody is capable of. You know, if you're walking to the train station and you see somebody that's hungry, you know, whenever I'm in New York, you know, a, a lot of unhoused people, they stop and talk to me. I must just have the vibe. But yeah. sometimes I ask me for money, I'll say, I don't give out money, but if you're hungry, I'll buy I'll something to eat. You. Yes, sometimes I will feed take, you. Sometimes I take them to the restaurant, get them something to eat. So, you know, it's it's like building a relationship with anybody. It takes yeah. time. Sometimes you get along, sometimes you don't. There's no difference with the unhoused. The only difference I'll really say is because of the lifestyle, they're more susceptible to like mental health issues. Living on the street is just tough. <laughs> yeah. Very tough. I, the thing that comes to mind for me, if I can jump in, is is courage, Cole. I, I think that it's very easy for us to accept whatever the dominant narrative is about why people are on the streets, and 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 we, you know, our culture likes to make everything transactional. So it's like. And just give them some money and then I don't, uh, you know, but it, it's, I think people are afraid that it could be them. And yeah. I think that it takes courage yeah. to reach across and talk to people uh, when, you're not, then, when you're not sure, when you don't know what their dynamic is and, and what it is. So, you know, you know studio, that's a new way. That's a new mm -hmm. opening. Go ahead. Um, so I'm a Jamaican American. So my mom is Jamaican, I'm first generation American. I don't know if there are any Caribbean people out there, but very strict, very tough lifestyle. But one thing that I was just raised was do not speak to homeless people. That was part of like her trying to take care of me. Like she didn't want me to be a cat. And so she thought that that was helping me, but what that really did was create a barrier where I was afraid. I had this fear that I didn't even know where it came from. So the first time that I actually spoke to an unhoused person, I was terrified. I was like, what if they reject me? Like, what if they don't want to talk to me? You know, I'm coming over here, got some lip gloss on and my hoop earrings. I'm not going to dress it down. And, you know, what are they going to think? But it was so, I, I spoke to them like a person and they knew I was a little fearful, but they knew I was humble. And the more that I've spoke, spoken with on the in-house is the more comfortable I am. Um, and sometimes I have to check them. Sometimes they want to pass their plates and you know, hey, can I get you a number? I'm not here for this. I'm not looking for a husband under the bridge. I'm looking to help people get housing. So it's it's the same it's the same thing that you go through that you deal with with, with house people. But I think that if we humanize the in house, we can start to visualize these solutions where it just seems like, of course, we should help people get into housing. Of course, we should have social services. Of course, we should place people in mental health care. They're just things that we all need in order to thrive. 
and housing is one of them. Beautiful. I know I'm supposed, I'm supposed to use something else up. Am I? Favorite? Free. No. Give me you, some you, you, no, I'm, 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 I'm so passionate, but I'm, I, I, I believe it because I live it. And, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to share with other people that, you know, if you experience what I experience, your mind would be blown away. It's, it's the best feeling. It gets discouraging only when you focus on yourself. When I focus on how is this helping everybody, it feels mm. so good. I, th I think you're on to something huge and um, you're, you're really resonating with like putting people first, no matter what your situation is. Um, yeah. and, and to speak to what Papa was saying earlier, um, there's a lot of reasons why someone can be unhoused, you know, um, you know, from a, from a personal experience right now, we, we have, um, you know, my wife has a family member who's 21 years old living, living on the streets. You know, and she has a whole entire family support system that is trying to to bring her back and get her the help and support that she needs. Uh, but there's addiction involved. Um, there's anger, there's animosity involved. There's a lot of things, it's it's complex. Mm. You know? um, but to speak to what you're saying, that doesn't make her any less of a person. That doesn't make her any less human. That doesn't make you know our family want to stop trying to, to help. <clears throat> You know, but not everyone that's unhoused has a family support system that's going out for there. So organizations like yours is huge. You know, you're doing the heavy lifting for a community of people that well, just don't have the support otherwise. And I think that's I think that's freaking amazing. So with that, yeah. <laughs> say, I'm sorry. We become the family. We do so become the family. I, I want to jump in, I, and I'm not because I'm not sure where we're supposed to go next on the uh, on the content. But I, I believe that we need to play some of Cole's music. <laughs> I, I think that's where we are. Can anyone confirm? <laughs> yeah, I'll I'll confirm that. And and well, this is the gift power for the people music video, and yeah. um, I shot it at one of the places that they serve breakfast to the unhoused um, every day. So uh, I've been doing outreach there for several months and we decided, we asked, could we shoot this music video there? I thought it was important to pe for people to see just what happened. So I'm performing in the music video. It's a song that I composed and wrote and produced and you can check out what's happening in the back. It's called Give Power to the People. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna have to say that uh, I may or may not have the correct one. Uh, and it's just, if anybody's ever run a live stream, it's because of the way we have to name <laughs> these things. Um, it happened. <laughs> yeah. This is a music video. This is video three, I assume. That's correct, Lewis. All right. That's, that's what I needed to know. <laughs> All right. Here we go. The Black Panther. Coined the phrase power to the people during the freedom movement. Today, right now, in this moment, we are all called to uplift those people that you don't make eye contact with and pass on the street, the least of ours. We gotta dig deep, and we gotta dig deeper. We gotta scream, we gotta shout. We got to bang on doors, and we got to let them know to empower the people. We must give power to the people. Uh, yesterday is far away. My tomorrow's your today. Nothing's what it really seems to be. Walk the road, let's travel. Then you find yourself in trouble. Some people don't want some people to be free. We give in power to the people. We give in power to the people. 
Like get it, girl, get it, get it. <laughs> yeah. It was so cold. <laughs> and uh, Charlie Steiner, he's the um, video director at WWOZ, and I talked him into meeting me at five thirty in the morning so that we could set up and make sure that we caught every having breakfast because they're out there about six a.m. Breakfast is over at seven a.m. So we had to finish like six forty-five. Wow. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I hope that shows a, a, just a snapshot of, like, what happens bright and early in the morning every day for the unhoused. Like, they're lining up and getting their breakfast. <laughs> mm. you, you know, Cole, I have, I have a note here. You know, Cole's training in the Ella Baker style of organi organizing by Curtis Muhammad. You know, why does this approach, why does this approach give power to the people? You know, and 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 the, what drives you to compose a, a song such like this? And by the way, I hear the Jamaican influences. At first, I was like, "Where's my, where's, I'm like, where's my horns at?" But they were really tucked nice in there. That at the end, they came through. So everything about that track was really really nice. Um, <laughs> I digress. Um, why does this get power to the people? What's tell me about the about the the inspiration in creating this song? Um, get getting up every day and demonstrating with the in house, um, developing friendships, developing relationships, um, those relationships being transient. You know, sometimes we just fell out of touch. You know, people people living on the street are living a completely different lifestyle. It's a totally different culture that I don't think people understand. And I just got immersed in it. And it's like going to the mountaintop and learning all these things and you're just like, oh my goodness, like, but if we do this and if we could do that, if, if y'all knew this and I wanted to run and tell everybody. So I created this music um, out of necessity, you know, during the pandemic, I had nothing to do besides drink some vodka, um, you know, organize and just figure out like what was going on in the world and what was gonna happen with the rest of my life. But I was like, I, as an artist, I have to document what's going on but I have to document all these beautiful things that I'm learning, specifically the Ella Baker style of organizing, which is you go to the ones most in need and you talk to them, you build community, you go to the bottom. You don't try to figure out how to solve the problem of poor people by going to academics. So you organize with them and you take your time and you're patient. And when you think you're running out of patient, you become even more patient because um, one thing that I learned with uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee is that in order to organize Black people in the South to get them their right to vote, they had to teach a lot of people how to read. So organizers from the East Coast came over and from the North came over Black and White. And um, some of these people, it was the first time that a, a white person had stayed with a Black family, the first time that a Black family had seen a white person up close. So there were just a lot of expectations um, that people had of what from what they're used to. 
but they didn't know how to work together. And so I know a lot of people coming from means, they had to be patient teaching adults, 50, 60, 70 year olds, 70 year olds, how to read. But it was about not pushing their own agenda, about pushing the agenda of the people. So give power to the people is if we want to empower all people, then we need to equally distribute the power amongst everyone. So if I'm a carpenter, then everybody that wants to know how to be a carpenter, if they're in my neighborhood, in my community, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you and you bring it back to the community. So we shouldn't hoard all of these goods and services. Like, let's share it because one. we're... <laughs> each one, teach one. I always say that, yep. You know, when I, when I hear about people, oh, my grandmother passed, my grandfather passed, she was 105. I'm like, did you sit down and, and talk to him and record his thoughts? And what? Because when they leave, they're taking so much with them. And so many people don't do that. They, your grandmother's, your grandmother's 90 something, start talking to her, start recording, whatever, give her a little taste of something and let her mind, let her just go and record. Because, hey, you know, they've got so much to share with us, you know, and they just take it with them. God that's bless. So and that's why I felt so blessed to work with Curtis because Curtis was an elder and he said, all, all old people want to do is share their wisdom and knowledge with the young people. But a lot of young people don't take the time to sit and talk with them because they, you know, they talk slow. The stories be two hours long, you know, it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I went to one of those long stories with Curtis. Curtis could talk about two, three, four hours, you know, straight. But I realized how special a position I was in. And so I absorbed everything that he shared with me like a sponge because I knew I would need it later. And there's not oh, a day yeah. that goes back. I'm not affected. And it was enjoyable, it. wasn't it? Immensely. I'm 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 an organizer because he introduced me into this world of organizing. So I'm adding yeah. it to the music. It's a wonderful family. Yeah. Cool. I love that. This brings me to um another song that I want to ask Lewis to cue up, you know, and We'll jump into this af after we hear the song, but I'm, I'm curious to hear about gathering and organizing musicians and citizens and students and how they're playing a role in being active community members and participants in this initiative. Um, Can you repeat that, baby? I'm sorry. I'm say that one more time. Can you repeat that? Yeah, I, I wanna. I wanted to ask Lewis to cue up another song, uh, "Sign of the Times," and I really, once we get back from this song, I want to understand. You know how you're mobilizing musicians and citizens and students and getting them to become active in this initiative i really just want to kind of get the scope of you know essentially how you're rallying everyone to this causing and getting them fired up with with your passion um Lewis, is that a good space to go good place to go i'm i'm, I'm so ready <laughs> When you stand, when you fight, when you protect what is right, oh, no more standing on the side, lines are getting longer, the least of ours are stronger, whoa, whoa, whoa. Someone has to care right now. What you think is what you do. What you say is how you move. Now is the time to live as one. Ha. These are the signs. These are the signs. Said these are the signs. You know what? 
Now is the time. I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. It's the time for us to get together for real, for real. Get down in some real humanity. Let's stop looking at our differences and ways to separate us and feel and think about all the ways that we are one. Together we stand, divided we fall. Hey. Things ain't getting better. Ha. The damage is done. Shepherd out and reach to the sun. Oh, what they do to you. Whoa, they do to me. And someone that has to care right now. Hey. Is that a take on that biblical line? What they do to you, they do to me. What you do to the least of me, you is that sort of like a take on that? That is, that is. You know, that's our motto. That's our motto with the Greater New Orleans Citizens Belief Team. You know, right. what you do to the least of us, you do unto me. So right. that's what about that holistic humanity, you know. That stands out so strong in a song. It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I think Fabian, I think we're doing it right now. I think the way to organize more musicians into this is to get more musicians aware um to, to tug at the ones that have that are already in that space you know papa molly and i play and um you know like i said one of the reasons that i really vibe with papa is he comes to to this space like we meet each other and already has his own sense of purpose with humanity and his songs are all about you know love and healing and so it's like everybody can't be the the, the head chef right but everybody can take different positions so my focus with humanity is on housing but there's so many other places that we, we can go with it but just because you're not focused on housing doesn't mean that you can't be focused on housing eventually if that's your interest but just to be aware and to feel that people are, should be treated with dignity and respect, regardless of what level class that, that you're on. Um, we have a lot of volunteers that have been with us for years you know, and some that have been with us for a week. You know, I think that people get nervous. They think that once you volunteer with an organization, like you can show up on their schedule. And that's just not the case. Do what you can, it should be fun. So if you wanna come once a month, volunteer once a month. If you wanna volunteer, you know, every week, Go ahead and do that. But I think it's about just finding the people that feel a purpose and know like how how, how much better we can be as a society if we all take action. Mm -hmm. I love that, Papa. I I, I don't want to not hear your voice. What what are your thoughts? I agree with what you're saying, Cole. I really do. It's it's you have to um, you know, there's so many different aspects to it houseless being just one of those aspects. Um, I know that I've spoken to people who um, have been displaced from their home situations. I've spoken with people that work with organizations that help those people. 
And just like you were saying earlier that you don't hand out money, um, but you will buy somebody a meal to eat. That's a that's something that I think resonates with a lot of people. Uh, and every city, you know, not just New Orleans, um, every city these days, you can't pull up to any busy intersection without there being people asking for money at the intersection. Uh, I think what's happening in some cases, now you, you have your finger on the pulse more than I do, Cole, so I don't wanna speak not knowing what I'm talking about because I'm a little bit out of touch with the scene um, in recent years, which is one of the reasons I wanted to work with you with this too, because it is something that is uh, near to my heart and something that I've worked with before. Um, helping to helping people that are without homes, without houses. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that I feel like a lot of people become uh, discouraged and become maybe a little bit jaded when they see people that look like they come from a privileged background. Um, able-bodied, like I said before, day after day on the same corner, taking money from cars that go by. They've got iPhones. They've got, oftentimes it looks like they have, um, you know, lots of dogs. Um, this is something that I've heard people say before. It's like, well, if they can afford to have iPhones and dogs, then why am I giving them money? You know, that sort of thing, okay? Yeah. Well, um, I can understand that, how you could feel that way, you know, but the thing is, is that you don't, it's not, they don't represent everybody that's that's living on the streets. They represent a pretty small percentage of those people. That's why it seems like it's the same people you see over and over on those intersections. How do you feel about that, Cole? I, I'm, 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 tr I'm, from where I'm coming from, it seems like those, folks may might be making quite a bit of money on those street corners and that's why they're so protective of them um i don't know that for a fact but i have heard other people say that um i don't really know i just i'm curious what, how you feel about that so though so i know specifically in new orleans um those people that you're talking about that uh seem like they might have some means they have the dogs um they're like cho so choosing it. Um, I mean, you still see some of them going in the grocery stores. Those are not the people that we're actually um, seeking out. That's um, what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. We're seeking out those people like um, single mothers that are living on the street with their uh, yes. children. Yes. Grandmothers. Right now we just started. So um, we're working with three regular unhoused people right now. One, um, might have um might have cancer so oh. i'm taking them to the doctor to get tests to get their tests done on monday so i've already scheduled some time for that um yeah. one of them like was displaced because of hurricane ida he's 70. he said he's never been he's never lived on the street before so i'm trying to help him find immediate ways to get housing possibly we might have to do a fundraiser to raise um money for materials or get get those materials but mm -hmm. this is this is work that I don't get paid for at all, but I just know how helpful it is to know that you have one person that cares about you, that one person yeah. that supports you doesn't want anything. So um, here's the thing. I think that this world is filled with a lot of stuff, good, bad, and ugly. And um, whatever you look for, you find it. And so I just continue to look for like the good. Like if I look at those posers living on the right. street and, and for money, then I will get detracted from like the real mission, which are there actually are some people that don't have a choice. So, um, there's a lot of people that don't have a choice. That that was my point. I was trying to make too is that there's a lot of people who do not have a choice, and they're or, uh, they're trying to get off the street, and they're trying to transition back to the life that they left behind. However, they they can do that. Whereas there's another element that's become bigger in recent years to it seems like to me for lack of a better word this is i've heard people refer to them as gutter punks 
Um, you know, uh, it's like it's a younger element that seems to be kind of just uh, hanging out on the street, getting money for drugs and partying or whatever. And then, you know, it, that seems to be hurting the people who need it the most. That's my Are point. they houseless or they're just in the streets? Well, and who knows? Who that, knows? Well, it, it seems like it seems like they are living on the street by choice to me because hmm. there are options if you're if you're not physically disabled and you and you're young and you know and, and a lot of these people are from i mean this what i've read other people have researched i haven't done the research myself so i don't want to pretend like i know i'm just saying that what i've read is that a lot of these kids some of them are just kids in their teens and early 20s are from privileged homes, from privileged backgrounds. They're just choosing to live a transient lifestyle that involves mm -hmm. drugs and street and a street life. And uh, there's uh, there's they're more visible because they're out on the street corners every day, getting money from passing cars. And wow. uh, and I think it I think it turns a lot of people off to the plight of the houseless. And those who would love to have a chance, that would love to feel like they were able to contribute something um, and to feel value as valued as a human and seen as a human being again. You see what I mean? I think uh, um, it, you know, it's it almost like, like the people that I'm specifically talking about seem to be, uh, it seems to be like a lifestyle choice even from the clothes they wear to the like you know that look like they've been dyed in black dye and and they you know they have pit bulls and they have iphones and they they're um so those, they're hanging out together have, you know and drinking and doing drugs yeah. on the street and Do i just have i'm not being judgmental about that at all i'm just saying that it seems like that's hurting the uh so those people, they don't sign up for housing. Like those people don't go to like brace at the green light for breakfast. Those right. people are nowhere where actual unhoused people are in camping. Those people are literally just like on those street corners, but they're not in the encampments. Um, right. Most unhoused people, like they have, well, here in New Orleans, there, there are these encampments under the underneath the bridge or near the bridge. Um, that a lot of them stay together in um, for safety reasons, you know, it, because it mm -hmm. doesn't fall there. But like what you're talking about, that is a totally different um, like group of people. I think that they're kind of trying to pose um, like they're people without means. Um, but I wouldn't say that they hurt the cause. I think that if anybody wants to help, you know, <laughs> you can you can look up what's in your neighborhood and your community to see like what organizations actually have some sort of value. What my organization is saying is that it's not that any other organization is doing the wrong thing. What we're saying is that we have to expand the way that we look at treating unhoused people and human beings in general. And um, I don't think that any of the ways that, in which they do business have changed. I don't see any reason why somebody needs to show proof of being homeless, like have a letter that they were no, given to by mm -hmm. that runs it. They have to have that letter like signed and dated and then a year later, like they have to have that letter again. And then hopefully they've been moved up on the waiting list. But I've seen unhoused people and it's amazing what can happen to a person living on the street for one year. Like you'll start off very sane and it would be amazing how insane you can become just by having to be susceptible to like that lifestyle, drugs and rats and you know how am i going to take a shower and what am i going to eat you know so and, and i'm sure you know you know there's lots of women out there that are just you know being preyed upon too i know you know it's it's a it's, it's a horrible situation for it's anybody fun. um so uh i guess the only point i was trying to make is that it does seem like there's been a um you know, an increase in kids who seem like they're privileged or from privileged backgrounds choosing to live on the streets in New Orleans and, you know, panhandle all day and party all night. And I, I think 
that uh, if somehow we could, you know, address that with like without being completely judgmental because addiction is its own uh, prison in a way, you know, it's its own disability. Call, call their parents. They need home training. <laughs> we we want to. We're talking to those people that like came out of incarceration, and yeah. uh, their grandmother passed away. That was their last living relative. Or you know, some people have told me stories about like the family home was stolen by the sister, and there's all these interfamily you know dynamics happening. Um, some people that are living on the street actually work like nine to five jobs, and sometimes when they save up enough money. They stay at a hotel. You'd be surprised at like how many people working in restaurants and hotels and just you know corporate America um, don't have enough money for that uh, for that rent every month or for yeah. the security. Yeah, you know, it's, it's lifestyle. So what we're really saying is, let's tend to everything. Like it's not just food. It's not just clothing. It's not you know. There's like a ten point plan. Like the things that everybody needs to be able to thrive, water, food, clothing, shelter, transportation, health care, mental health care, child care, yes. energy, self-governance, the right to take care of ourselves. That is being taken care of. When we see something going on that we think can be done better, we're not going to wait for the government to step in and take care of it. We're going to model that behavior. So we're actually modeling the behavior and we're gonna to continue to model it until somebody bites. But somebody so, has to bite because it's feeding the community. I mean, it's, you got, Papa, you're gonna come on Saturday when, when you're not working on Friday night. But it, it's such so, so an amazing thing to see all types of people working together. And we have people from all walks of life just walking up and asking for groceries. We have some prostitutes walking up we have some grandmothers walking up. We have people stopping by in their cars. You have some groceries. Oh, you know, um, I see I have toilet paper this week. Can I buy a roll? You don't have to buy anything, but just take what you need and give what you can. And we've been able to develop this strong um, community of organizers that are like right there in the community and just watch them grow. So let me, uh... I don't think it's going to happen. Sorry, let me jump in and ask, because uh, we're at that point or close. Uh, Cole, um, for the people who are watching this live stream and the people who uh, support you and your music and 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 Papa Molly and Carlton, your fans and the Robito family, what can people do uh, to help you uh, in this process? Um, well, first we have a GoFundMe. Um, we have a GoFundMe page that uh, we're raising money for our work. Uh, it has the video of our work, it has the history of our work, and links to all our websites. To hear my music, you can go to colewilliamsmusic.com. Um, I'm on YouTube, I'm on all of that stuff. And um, is there another one? You mentioned a petition, I think, at some point. There's a petition online? That's the most important thing. Right now, we are raising awareness, and we're trying to get the signatures for this petition, which um, essentially is demanding that the city of New Orleans set aside 20% of all homes being used for auction to house the homeless. So instead of just selling all of these uh, homes to developers for a really cheap price, <laughs> let's set aside 20% of that. And that that petition is on change.org. Okay, and that's that's gonna be in the, in the comments down there, uh, the petition. Yeah. And I think there are plenty of uh, Rope It Up fans and, and your fans and, and Carl and Papa's fans in New Orleans that can that can just take that simple action and just start there. You want to go further? Go okay. further. Great. And don't forget to listen to the music. That's the most important thing. I'd like to play. Um, uh, we, we have a couple of minutes. And Cole, if there's anything else you'd like to say uh, b before, but then I'm, I want to play uh, this. I'm just dying to get to this. 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 Uh, well, I just want to second song. organize. That's what I want to say. We got to organize and we can do it. I believe it. I believe in the power of all of us. I also want to say, please make sure that y'all follow Carlton Jamal Smith. He's on YouTube. He's on social media. He has music out. It's wonderful. Follow Papa Molly. Same thing. YouTube. Um, all the social media. These are incredible musicians that have an incredible voice. Thank you, Cole. Incredible humans as well. I mean, I, I, I made a note here. Check out Papa Mal. I've been, you know, okay, I'm going to go on YouTube. I'm going to go wherever I got to go. I'm going to check out some Papa Mal. All right. 
Yeah, I, I was I was checking on one of your songs that I just absolutely love, man. The one, and then one I want to produce the Earth, Wind & Fire uh, Fabian Brown band, uh, Fabian Brown's yeah. offspring. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Dig your voice a lot, man. Dig your voice. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Papa. Thank you, Papa. Absolutely, yeah. Fabian, you got the silvers over there. Come on, man. Stop playing. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I, wanna, I just want to tell everybody as we close out, we're going to stay on the Zoom, hang out and chat. I'm going to play some music. Um, but I want to tell everybody that, you know, if you uh, want to have Cole Williams back and continue this series, we're going to do it anyway. But let us know in the comments. Go ahead and like it and post it. Let we're us know, it. y'all. Because this is you, important. You know I get to talk it, so. <laughs> All right, let's do this part and then we'll... Space! 
the Black Panthers, coined the phrase, power to the people, during the freedom movement. Today, right now, in this moment, we are all called to uplift those people that you don't make eye contact with and pass on the streets, the least of ours. We gotta dig deep, and we gotta dig deeper. We gotta scream, we gotta shout, 